say that uh, because the president is coming to address the Republican conference of the House, uh, this hearing will end at one o'clock sharp. So uh, would everybody please make note of that and judge their time accordingly. I'd like to welcome everybody to the first hearing of the subcommittee. <clears throat> Acknowledge ranking member, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, and also welcome the full committee chair, Mr. Goodlap. Uh, today's hearing will investigate, uh, will focus on how America investigates and prosecutes 21st century cyber threats. The United States has been the subject of the most coordinated and sustained computer attacks the world has ever seen. Rival nations, particularly China, have been invading corporate computer, computer systems and stealing intellectual property at an increasing rate. Spying between governments has always been a fact of life. But in the digital age, the spying is more pervasive and harder to guard against. The systematic and strategic theft of intellectual property by foreign governments threatens one of America's most valuable commodities, our innovation and hard work. In 2011, the American Superconductor Corporation supplied sophisticated software for wind turbines to Sinovel, a giant Chinese wind turbine corporation. When American engineers went to China to repair a wind turbine, they discovered that Chinese wind turbines were already using a stolen version of the American software. Worse, the Chinese company had complete access to the American company's proprietary source code. Because they possessed this important code, the Chinese didn't need the American Superconductor Corporation anymore. A few months later, Sinovil abruptly began turning away shipments. <clears throat> On April 5, 2011, the American Superconductor Corporation had no choice but to announce that Cinevel, its biggest customer, accounting for more than two-thirds of the company's $315 million in revenue in 2010, had stopped making purchases. The result of the American, for the American company, investors fled, erasing 40% of the company's value in a single day, than 84% of its value by September 2011. This week, the Obama administration has finally increased public pressure on Chinese cyber spying. On Monday, the president's national security advisor announced what the media has called the White House's most aggressive response to a series of military-style hacks of American corporations. Describing the problem as a key point of concern and discussion at all levels of government, uh, Mr. Donilon said Beijing should take serious steps to investigate and put a stop to these activities. I agree. The fact that such mild comments have termed the administration's most aggressive ever may be part of the problem. When one country decides to advance its economy by stealing our intellectual property, we must do more than simply ask Beijing to investigate. Make no mistake, Cineville stole hundreds of millions of dollars from the American Superconductor Corporation. This is a company that received over $20 million in stimulus money from the U.S. taxpayers. But far from demanding our $20 million back, the administration's strongest rebuke has been to ask that Beijing take serious steps to investigate. We simply cannot outsource the fight against cybercrime to international diplomacy. The theft of valuable intellectual property is a serious strategic threat to the American economy, and it must be treated as such by U.S. law enforcement. Congress has repeatedly addressed the issue of cybercrime. In 2000 or 1986, Congress implemented the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act as a tool for law enforcement to combat computer crimes. As computer crimes continue to evolve, so too has the CFAA, which Congress has amended eight times since its enactment. It may be time for Congress to augment and approve the CFAA and other criminal statutes to enable law enforcement to combat international criminal enterprises. The administration has taken initial steps to address the growing cyber threat. We applaud the administration for its efforts, but it remains to be seen whether these steps will actually work. Today, the committee will look at the criminal laws and investigative tools to combat cybercrime. We will determine what changes can be made to our criminal laws to more effectively combat and deter the cyber attacks we are enduring. 
We will discuss what protection can be provided for the privacy of Americans through data breach notification laws. Then we will discuss what steps can be taken by this committee to protect the intellectual property and sensitive government information that hackers and foreign governments seek to obtain. As we saw from China's cyber attack on Google and other companies, America's edge in innovation and technical superiority can be compromised by competing countries that make theft of intellectual property a national strategy. I look forward to hearing more about this issue and thank all of our witnesses for participating in today's hearing. It is now my pleasure to recognize for his opening statement the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, because of our growing reliance on the Internet and computer networks, I welcome today's hearing to examine the cyber threats we face and to discuss how we can better protect ourselves against them. This hearing comes at a time when there is a rise in the severity of cyber, cyber threats, and so an update of our computer crime statutes may have to be considered. It's critical that we work together uh, on this effort with the members of Congress, administration, with the business community, and with private advocates to find ways to enhance the security of our government information systems, our business computer systems, and our personal use on the, of the Internet. And while it's the job of Congress to evaluate and update our laws in response to changing circumstances, we have to be careful that any changes we make will actually improve the law and not just ratchet up penalties in an exercise of soundbite politics. Often the problem is lack of investigation, enforcement investigation, and prosecution, and so penalties become irrelevant if a case isn't even investigated in the first place. This is particularly important in the case of Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, a law whose breadth of scope and sometimes questionable application has already uh, generated concern by citizens and narrowing by the courts. The last Congress, we met to discuss many of these same issues and the cyber threats of course remain an urgent issue of national economic and personal security. At that time I raised concerns about one provision in the proposed uh, law and that was the mandatory, uh, mandatory minimum sentencing for certain crimes of damaging critical infrastructure computer, computers. Uh, this committee has heard uh, new, a lot of testimony on mandatory minimums. They've been found to waste the taxpayers' money, do nothing about um, uh, crime, uh, and often result in sentences that are violative of common sense. Uh, this committee has uh, recently also uh, focused on the issue of federalism, so we have to be concerned about whether the Computer Pro Fraud and Abuse Act appropriately focuses on behavior that we all believe rises to the level of federal criminal liability. That statute was, statute was originally enacted to deal with intrusions into computers, what we now call hacking, and at that time we have, since that time, we've extended the scope of the law on several occasions, which has led to expansive uses in recent years, which have generated concerns on both sides of the aisle. I hope we can work together to address those concerns. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we know that uh, Criminal target, criminals target computers and cyber networks of individuals, companies, and our government. That's why we have to enhance our protective measures that we take at every level to prevent cyber intrusions. I applaud the President's uh, resolve to work with industry to better resolve our critical infrastructure. His executive order will improve the sharing of information with industry and establish a framework for best practices to help companies step up to cyber protection. As in every area of crime policy, public safety demands that we engage in level-headed efforts to identify and implement comprehensive evidence-based solutions, and I hope we can do that in this case. Uh, before I uh, close, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that a letter uh, signed by um, uh, 20 Internet companies expressing their concerns about the scope of the current Computer Fraud and Abuse Act be entered into the record. Without objection. And it is now my pleasure to recognize for his opening statement the chairman of the full committee, gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I very much appreciate your holding this hearing, and I will uh, submit my full statement for the record uh, in order to uh, save a little time for our witnesses, but I do want to make a few points. First of all, yesterday, uh, and I would uh, submit these for the record, uh, the uh, Secret Service launched an investigation of the alleged hacking of private information of Vice President Joe Biden, First Lady Michelle Obama, FBI Director Robert Mueller, Attorney General Eric Holder, 
and many others. And the president yesterday also acknowledged that hacking of personal data is a big problem. Without objection, the material will be entered. Thank you. But that's uh, just the beginning of this problem. Uh, cyber intrusions are just the tip of the iceberg. In November 2011, the National Counterintelligence Executive, the agency responsible for countering foreign spying on the U.S. government, issued a report that hackers and illicit programmers in China and Russia are pursuing American technology and industrial secrets, jeopardizing an estimated $400 billion in U.S. research spending. According to the report, China and Russia view themselves as strategic competitors of the United States and are the most aggressive collectors of U.S. economic information and technology. Further, in January of this year, the New York Times reported it has been the victim of a sustained cyber attack by Chinese hackers. Shortly afterward, the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post also reported they too had been breached by similar sources. The Times commissioned a report from Mandiant, a private investigative agency which traced the cyber attacks to a unit of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. According to the report, the Chinese are engaged in massive cyber spying on the American industrial base and in areas the Chinese are trying to develop for their own national purposes. Earlier this year, the administration issued a cybersecurity executive order and presidential directive aimed at helping secure America's cyber networks. The executive order is a first step towards protecting our public and private networks from attack, but Congress can and must do more. The Judiciary Committee is responsible for ensuring that our federal criminal laws keep pace with the ever-evolving cyber landscape. Our challenge is to create a legal structure that protects the invaluable government and private information that hackers seek to exploit while allowing the freedom of thought and expression that made this country great. I would uh, submit the rest of my statement for the record, and I thank the chairman. Without objection, the ranking member and chairman emeritus of the committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers. Uh, thank you, Chairman Sensenbrenner. Uh, I'd like to <coughs> welcome the witnesses and uh, note that I am reintroducing today a bill that I introduced in 2012, July or August, the Cyber Privacy Fortification Act, uh, which will create a strong standard for data breach notification, which doesn't exist now and is a great reason for us uh, to be conducting this hearing. Uh, it requires uh, a data breach activity to be uh, made uh, public, made uh, notified uh, to us so that we can uh, measure uh, just what's going on. Uh, cyber attacks have increased according to the National Security Agency by 44 percent, and uh, uh, many of these attacks are perpetuated or perpetrated by criminals operating uh, beyond our national boundaries, intent on stealing our intellectual property, assessing financial accounts, and compromising our, our critical uh, uh, infrastructure. And, and so we, we've got a problem here. And it's one that I, I think this committee is, is perfectly suited to handle. And uh, uh, we, I would recommend, and I'll be looking for discussion on this, uh, the increasing collaboration necessary between the government and the private sector on cybersecurity, but not at the expense of the privacy of, of innocent citizens. Uh, we must not toss aside existing privacy restrictions to grant the government and law enforcement unwarranted access to private communications. Uh, the, the administration and others have called for private sector companies to be allowed to share communications in their possession 
for the purpose of protecting against cyber threats. We must require that any additional sharing only be allowed to occur if information is removed that can be used to identify persons unrelated to the cybersecurity threat itself. And in, in, in addressing a recent uh, cybersecurity conference, FBI Director Mueller emphasized that law enforcement focused need for this information is limited to threats and attacks, not other sensitive information about company secrets or customers. This must be the condition for enhancing collaboration between the government and the private sector to uh, better secure our computer networks. And finally, the internet has made the world a smaller place and because cyber attacks are often launched outside of our borders, now more than ever, we need a diplomatic engagement to increase cooperation between nations on cybersecurity issues. In other words, diplomacy is going to have a larger role uh, in, in this activity. I submit the rest of my statement and I yield back to the chairman. Uh, without objection, the rest of the statement will be included in the record. And without objection, all members' opening statements will be included in the record. We have a very distinguished panel today, and I will begin by recognizing the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Delbaney, who will introduce the first witness. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my pleasure to introduce Jenny Durkin. Um, Ms. Durkin currently serves as the United States Attorney for the Western District of Washington, where my district is located. She is the top federal law enforcement officer of 19 counties in Western Washington. She was nominated by President Obama in May of 2009 and was confirmed by a unanimous vote of the U.S. Senate on September 29th of 2009. Ms. Durkin chairs the Attorney General's Advisory Subcommittee on Cybercrime and Intellectual Property Enforcement. She is also a member of three other subcommittees, Terrorism and National Security, Civil Rights, and Native American Issues. Ms. Durkin is a Seattle area native who grew up in Issaquah, Washington, graduated from the University of Notre Dame, and received her law degree from the University of Washington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Before Chair. recognizing you, Ms. Durkin, let me introduce the rest of the members of the panel. Uh, Mr. Bowles currently serves as the Deputy Assistant Director for the Cyber Division of the FBI, where he oversees FBI cyber operations and investigations. He entered on duty with the FBI in Sacramento in 1995, where he successfully investigated an Internet Ponzi scheme that defrauded 15,000 victims in 57 countries. In 2009, as assistant special agent in charge of the San Diego Division, he oversaw six investigative squads over cyber and white collar crime matters, as well as directing the administrative program from the office. Mr. Bowles was a legal attache to Kiev, Ukraine in 2003, where he successfully facilitated the first extradition from Ukraine to the United States. He served as the Special Assistant to the Executive Assistant Director, National Security Branch, and in 2011 was selected as the Special Agent in Charge of the Norfolk FBI Office. He is a graduate of the University of Georgia. Mr. Robert Holliman serves as President and CEO of BSA, the Software Alliance. He is also appointed by President Barack Obama to serve on the Advisory Committee for Trade Policy and Negotiations, the principal advisory committee for the U.S. government on trade matters. He oversaw an innovative study of cloud computing related policies around the world and is an advocate for breaking down barriers that cloud providers face when they do business internationally. He also is an early proponent for policies that promote the widespread deployment of security technologies and to build public trust and confidence in cyberspace. He has testified before Congress, the European Commission, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and other governing bodies on technology, trade, and economic matters. He previously served as a counselor and legislative advisor in the Senate, an attorney in private practice, and a judicial clerk in the U.S. District Court. 
He holds a bachelor's degree from Trinity University in San Antonio, where he was named Distinguished Alumnus in 2012 and received his law degree from Louisiana State University. He completed the Stanford Executive Program at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Professor Oren Kerr is a professor of law at George Washington University where he teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and computer crime law. Before joining the faculty in 2001, Professor Kerr was an honors program trial attorney in the computer crime and intellectual property section of the criminal uh, division at the Department of Justice, as well as a special assistant U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. He is a former law clerk for Justice Anthony Kennedy of the U.S. Supreme Court and Judge Leonard Garth of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. In the summer of 2009 and 10, he served as special counsel for the Supreme Court nominations to Senator John Cornyn on the Senate Judiciary Committee. He's also been a visiting professor at the University of Chicago Law School and the University of Pennsylvania Law School. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering from Princeton, Master of Science from Stanford, and earned his Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School. Now, each of the witnesses' written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety, and I ask that each witness summarize his or her testimony in five minutes or less. And uh, I'm going to be kind of like the Chief Justice, given the time constraints that we have with the President coming. So when the little red light appears before you, time's up. So we'll start, we'll start with you, Ms. Durkin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Sensenbrenner, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you this afternoon regarding the investigation and prosecution of cyber threats to our nation. I want to thank Congresswoman Del Bene for the introduction and for her service to our district. As United States Attorney, I see the full range of threats to our communities and to our nation. Few things are as sobering as the daily cyber threat briefing I receive. Technology is changing our economy and our daily lives. We have witnessed the rapid growth of wonderful companies life-saving technologies, and the way we connect with others. Unfortunately, the good guys are not the only innovators. We have also seen growth in the number and the sophistication of bad actors exploiting the new technology. Financially motivated international rings have stolen large quantities of personal data. Criminal groups develop tools and techniques to disrupt and damage computer systems, state actors, and organized criminals have demonstrated the desire and the capability to steal sensitive data, trade secrets, and intellectual property. One particular area of concern is computer crime that invades the privacy of individual Americans. Every day, criminals hunt for our personal and financial data, which they use to commit fraud or to sell to other criminals. Hackers perpetrate large-scale data breaches that leave hundreds of thousands if not millions, susceptible to identity theft. The national security landscape has evolved dramatically in recent years. Although we have not yet experienced a devastating cyber attack against our critical infrastructure, we have been victim to a range of malicious cyber activities that siphon off valuable economic assets and threaten our nation's security. There can be no doubt. Cyber threat actors pose significant risks to our national security and our economic interest. Addressing those complex threats requires a unified approach that incorporates criminal investigative and prosecutorial tools, civil and national security authorities, diplomatic tools, public-private partnerships, and international cooperation. Criminal prosecution, whether here in the United States or by a partner country, plays a central and critical role in this collaborative effort. We need to ensure that throughout the country, members of the Department of Justice who are actively working on these threats have the investigative resources and forensic capabilities to deal with these challenges. And we appreciate the support this committee has given in this regard. To meet these challenges, the department has organized itself to ensure that we are in a position to aggressively investigate and prosecute cybercrime wherever it occurs. The Criminal Division's Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section 
works with a nationwide network of over 300 assistant United States attorneys designated as our computer hacking and intellectual property prosecutors. They lead our efforts in this area. Similarly, the Department's National Security Division is organized to ensure that we are aggressively investigating national sec security cyber threats through a variety of means. These include counter-espionage and counterterrorism investigations and prosecutions. Recognizing the diversity of the national security cyber threats and the need for a coordinated approach, the Department established last year a National Security Cyber Specialist Network. It brings together the Department's full range of expertise on national security related cyber matters, drawing on experts from the National Security Division, the Criminal Division, U.S. Attorney's Offices, and other Department components to make sure that we have a centralized resource for prosecutors and agents around the country. Our efforts have led to a number of enforcement successes two of which I will highlight later, but I will say that in our district we have been able to bring these prosecutions very successfully and have made a difference for our citizens and for our businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bowles. Good morning, Chairman Sensenbrenner and distinguished members of the committee, uh, subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about the cyber threat and how we are going about it with our partners to combat it. As the subcommittee is aware, the number and sophistication of cyber attacks against our nation's private sector and, and the government networks has increased dramatically over the recent years and is expected to continue. We see four primary adversaries in the cyber world. Spies who seek to uh, steal our secrets, our intellectual property. Organized criminals who want to steal our identities and our money. Terrorists who would like to attack our critical infrastructure and hacktivist groups who are uh, trying to make a political or a social statement through the use of the internet. The bottom line here is that we're losing data, money, ideas, and innovation to a wide range of cyber adversaries. Uh, FBI Director Mueller has uh, stated that he expects the cyber threat to uh, surpass the terrorism threat in, in our nation in, in the coming years. Um, that's why we are strengthening our cyber capabilities in much in the same way that we enhance our intelligence and our national security capabilities in the wake of 9-11. Um, the FBI recognized the significance of the cyber threat more than a decade ago. And in response, the FBI developed uh, a, a number of uh, techniques to go after its strategy for uh, responding to it. We created the Cyber Division. We elevated the cyber threat to our number three national priority behind only uh, counterintelligence and counterterrorism. We've significantly increased our hiring of technically trained agents, analysts, and forensics uh, specialists. And we've expanded our partnerships with law enforcement, private industry, and academia. We've made great progress since the Cyber Division was first created in 2002. Back then, uh, we viewed it as a success when we were able to recognize that networks were being attacked. Just the fact that we saw it and recognized it was uh, the part of our success. So for the next nine year, eight or nine years, attribution, which is knowing who is responsible for the attack uh, on our computers and our networks, was considered the level of success. And we got very good at tracking the internet protocol address or the IP addresses to back to their source to determine who was responsible. Now we can, we can often tell when the networks are being breached and are able to determine who is doing it. So the question now becomes, as we move forward in this, is what are we going to do about it? You know, at, or how are we going to take action on this information that we've gathered? So the, the, the perpetrators of these attacks are often overseas, and in the past, tracking an IP back to a, a source in a foreign country it usually led to a dead end investigatively. Since then, we've embedded cyber agents with law enforcement in several key countries including Estonia, Ukraine, the Netherlands, and Romania. And we've worked with these, some of these countries to uh, expedite, extradite subjects from their uh, countries to stand trial in the United States. As I described in my written statement, a prime example of international collaboration came in 20, 2011 takedown of Rove Digital, a company that was founded by a ring of Estonian and Russian criminals to commit massive internet fraud scheme. Seven of these have since been indicted in the Southern District of New York, two of which uh, have been extradited to the United States now and are in U.S. custody and one pled guilty last month. Uh, while we're proud of this and our other successes, we're continuing to push ourselves so that we can respond more rapidly and prevent attacks before they occur. Over the past year, our legal, under our current legal authorities and with our government partners, we successfully warned potential victims before an attack has occurred. They were then able to use that information to shore up their network defenses and, and combat the attack. Uh, as we go into now, our next move here will be the next generation cyber. And these have all come apart as our initiative uh, to drive forward in the next gen. 
Next Gen Cyber entails a wide range of me measures, including focusing the cyber division specifically on computer intrusion in networks, as opposed to crimes committed with computers being a modality. Hiring additional computer scientists to assist with the technical investigations the FBI field offices, and expanding our partnerships and collaboration with the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force, or the NCIJTF. Briefly, the NCIJTF is a, a, a compendium of 19 agencies who uh, work together uh, in a collaborative and information sharing uh, environment so that we can almost in real time share information back and forth across a, a, the cyber threat. So it, the next step of that, of course, is our private sector outreach. We consider that as a, an important and as the next step for our whole of government team approach to combating cyber crime. <coughs> uh, we've reached into the, into the industry, developed the expertise with them, and are sharing as rapidly as it, in unseen rates that we've seen in the past. We now realize that the information flow must go both ways, where in the past we've taken information and not necessarily given them back act, uh, actionable intelligence. We have now rectified that, and in developing our partnership, we're able to, uh, to make that information flow go in both directions. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, to counter the threats that we face, we're engaging in an unprecedented level of co uh, collaboration within the U.S. government, with the private sector, and with international law enforcement. We look forward to continuing these uh, partnerships and expanding them with uh, the committee and with Congress. And uh, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holliman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Scott, members of the subcommittee, there are more than 400 million strains of malicious computer code in the world today, and their most frequent targets are here in the United States. And this costs American citizens and businesses well over $100 billion a year, and the losses are mounting. So I would like to recommend and outline a policy approach that BSA believes can help us address the nature of the threats that we face. It has three principal elements. First, promoting real-time information sharing. Second, strengthening law enforcement tools and resources. And third, supporting cybersecurity research and development. On the issue of promoting real-time information sharing, we know that to prevent cyber attacks, we need to be able to identify threats in real time. And the best way to do that is to let frontline IT professionals share information. And when companies and government agencies detect threats, they need to tell each other. Unfortunately, there are legal barriers and commercial disincentives that stand in the way when the private sector tries to share information with the government. First, there are liability concerns whenever you share commercial data. And second, there's a risk of exposing trade secrets. And BSA believes that we need legislation that promotes information sharing by addressing these issues. And we need to do that in a way that carefully balances privacy and civil liberties concerns. Secondly, we believe that we need to strengthen law enforcement tools and resources. Identifying emerging threats is important, but it is not nearly enough. We also need to enhance our ability to deter criminal behavior with effective law enforcement. We shouldn't be overzealous in prosecuting people for innocent mistakes or minor infractions, but we and the government needs tools and resources to send the strong message that there will be appropriate punishment for serious cyber crimes. Third, the last element we need to do is to create something that's really fundamental, that's elemental. We need to recognize that technology innovation is the best tool to combat long-term cyber threats. And BSA believes that we need a robust national R&D plan that involves um, technology companies, involved technologists within the governments to develop the resources to, to take our technologies and our practices and improve our country's overall cybersecurity policy. Now, the issue of data breach notification has come up as well, and uh, we appreciate uh, Mr. Conyers' uh, statement this morning. Um, we know that we'll never be completely risk-free or eliminate all the risks of cyber attacks, but as a separate but related matter to cybersecurity legislation, we also believe we should clarify how and when to notify people when a breach compromises their personal information. Today, there are 47 states that have their own laws, 
and BSA supports replacing that patchwork with a well-crafted federal law that simplifies compliance for businesses, but also ensures the proper notices when there is a breach of sensitive personal information. And lastly, when Congress is working on cybersecurity legislation, we also do that knowing that the administration is beginning to implement the president's recent executive order. And we're encouraged by the emphasis that order places on innovation, and we welcome the administration's plan to improve coordination of cybersecurity policy and increase information sharing from the government to industry. And these measures must embody principles that everyone can embrace. But it will take congressional oversight to ensure that the order is implemented effectively. And as the administration develops the framework it envisions for protecting critical infrastructure, it will be especially important to forge a close partnership with industry. We believe that NIST should have a lead role in that. And done well, there's an opportunity for the framework to serve as a model for best practices that can be extended beyond just critical infrastructure. So I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. BSA Forward looks forward to working with this committee and Congress to upgrade America's cyber readiness. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Halliman. Professor Kerr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify this morning. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is the primary federal computer crime statute, and its main prohibition is on unauthorized access to a computer. A year and a half ago, the subcommittee had a relatively similar uh, hearing to that today, uh, and at that time I testified about some of the recent court decisions which had adopted a very broad interpretation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, not only punishing what we would think of as hacking, breaking into a system, but also violating the terms of use on a computer, uh, doing something contrary to an employer's interest while using a computer, uh, and the like. And I warned about uh, the, the implications of that broad interpretation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Everyone agrees that the law should punish serious computer crimes, but I hope we would also agree that the law should not punish completely innocent activity, the kind of innocent activity that most Americans engage in every day might be violating terms of use on a website. That's that little language uh, that nobody reads off to the corner that everybody blows by when they uh, go to use a website or an internet service. Uh, it shouldn't be that violating those terms of service is a crime. Uh, some federal circuits have in fact indicated that that is the case. Uh, and a lot has changed, though, in the last 18 months since the last hearing. Uh, in the Ninth Circuit, the en banc uh, Ninth Circuit in United States versus Nozel uh, concluded that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act does not apply to breach of employer restrictions on access to a computer and is relegated only to sort of classic breaking into a machine, uh, what we might call hacking or we think of as hacking, uh, what the court called uh, circumventing a technological access barrier. Uh, also, in 2012, the Fourth Circuit decided a case concluding that an employee that acts in a way disloyal to an employer while using the employer's network is not violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, creating disagreement between the decision of the Fourth Circuit and another decision of the Seventh Circuit, which had indicated that that would be a federal crime. So right now, the state of the law in the lower courts interpreting this critical phrase of this critical statute, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, is essentially in disarray. There's uh, circuits that are all over the map in terms of just figuring out uh, what this prohibition means. What is this statute that's been on the books uh, for 25 uh, years? Uh, so I think this committee basically has two choices. Uh, one is to do nothing and let the Supreme Court figure it out. Uh, there's a circuit split. That means usually the Supreme Court at some point will step in and resolve the uncertainty and either pick the narrow view of the statute or the broad view of the statute or, or something in between. Uh, or Congress could act and actually clarify uh, which interpretation of the statute is the right one. I think this uh, Congress should act. Uh, this is a question ultimately of what Congress wants to prohibit. Uh, and I think the best approach is for Congress to enact the narrow view of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, essentially codifying the rule of the Ninth Circuit, United States versus Nozel, that what this statute does is prohibit breaking into a computer. Uh, we're, not, we're, we're not meeting here because we're worried about individuals breaching terms of service. We're not worried about uh, uh, employees of companies uh, checking Facebook on company time. We're worried about people hacking into critical infrastructure 
uh, uh, people uh, accessing United States secrets that are stored on computers from abroad. Uh, those are problems which would be uh, uh, prosecuted uh, and, and criminalized under any interpretation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But I think it's essential uh, that Congress narrow the statute and expressly adopt this narrow view rather than just wait for the Supreme Court to try to figure it out. Uh, we don't know what would happen if the Supreme Court took this case. Uh, and in all likelihood, no matter what the Supreme Court would do, we'd probably be back here to try to figure out what the laws should look like because there are hard cases to be dealt with on either side. Uh, uh, in particular, imagine the Supreme Court adopts the narrow view of the statute and says that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, only prohibits classic hacking into a network. In that case, there's uh, the problem of insiders that uh, take access from, they're, they're given access to the network, uh, but they s essentially steal secrets and then uh, send them to somebody else or use them uh, uh, in some nefarious way or maybe give them to a foreign government. We, of course, need to make sure that that's prohibited as well. Uh, and there are statutory authorities that can do that. For example, the theft of trade secret statute is available in those situations. But also we could uh, amend the Interstate Transportation of Stolen Property uh, Act, uh, which is used uh, to deal with the uh, transferring of stolen property in the case of physical property. Uh, the Justice Department has tried unsuccessfully to use that statute to prosecute uh, stolen information. Uh, the Second Circuit has said that's not a fair interpretation of the statute, and that could be amended to make sure the insider threat is dealt with. Uh, thank you. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, because of the time constraints, the chair will withhold his questions until the end if there's time remaining, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks, to start the questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here today. Uh, I don't envy your uh, jobs. Uh, it's uh, difficult when you're trying to marry uh, highly uh, esoteric technological uh, issues with uh, very precise uh, legal enforcement and prosecution issues, so I, I, it's a difficult challenge. And uh, it so happens that I'm new on this committee, so my primary uh, familiarity with uh, cybersecurity issues is on the Strategic Forces Committee where it's, there's a national security component and of course it is, a, it is an issue of the first magnitude. So my first question is to you Mr. Bowles. Um, given uh, that uh, some type of commercial intrusion, cyber intrusion, uh, carries with it to one set of, of uh, concerns and national security carries with it a whole different set of concerns, are there different protocols or, or more latitude in existing law when you're uh, doing what's necessary to protect our, our critical systems from national security threats or threats that have a national security nexus as opposed to the commercial intrusions? Thanks, sir. That leads right into, I, I spoke briefly about the Next Generation Cyber Initiative, and one of the things that we've seen in the change, that we've implemented in the, in the change of that initiative is putting all tools in the toolbox. We recognize that in the cyber world, crimes are essentially without borders, as, as, as one of the gentlemen said, that uh, the world has gotten smaller. Crimes are without borders, and it's, it's often difficult to tell at the outset, is it criminal or is it nationally, uh, national security oriented? So one of the things that we're working with the DOJ partners and with our other law, law enforcement partners is how do we bring all the tools to the toolbox to, to combat the threat? So is it, uh, for example, if it's a nation state actor who's uh, attempting economic, economic espionage and stealing trade secrets that then may um, enhance their national, their national economy and or structure, is that criminal? Is it, is it national security? I would say that it's both, and we have both sets of tools that we can bring to it. So it gives us a wide latitude, it makes us um, a much more nimble law enforcement uh, uh, community to, to go after and combat these threats by being able to, uh, to, to put the appropriate tool against the appropriate threat. But once you identify whether it is a national security threat or simply a commercial threat, um, do you have a different set of criteria in the law as it is now to, to combat those two, or are they treated essentially the same with, with as far as your, your tools to respond? Again, I'll, I will tell you, it, it sounds a little bit like I'm going to hedge on you, but I'm not. The, the, the fact of the matter is that by having both sets of tools in the toolbox, we've kind of melded the tool pro two protocols together. So what that means is, uh, w let's say, for example, we determine that is, in fact, a straight national security you know, intrusion or, or theft. You know, how can we go about disrupting that? The, part of the next generation cyber uh, initiative is to 
identify the hands on the keyboard, you know, the skin behind the screen, and how do we go after them and disrupt that? So is that through criminal prosecution? Is that through working with our uh, intelligence partners and our foreign partners overseas to disrupt in other manner uh, or shutting off access? There are, it's a multitude of uh, options that are open to us by doing that. So I would tell you that the protocols, by going to the all tools uh, approach, actually gives us access to both protocols through the entirety of the investigation. What, um, what would you suggest to this committee was uh, if we were to apportion our concern for each of those two things I mentioned, commercial intrusion as opposed to those threats that have a national security nexus, um, when you identify these threats, what, what would you suggest would be the proportion? I mean, how, how, how much under attack from your point of view, you know, we're familiar with it in some of the, the security committees, but uh, from your point of view in the FBI, how, what, what uh, would you suggest is the state of the union here as far as our protection from national security cyber threats? Um, do, you, you th do you think that we're facing pretty significant challenges? We're absolutely facing significant challenges. Uh, both at well, that was a leading question. Yes, uh, it was. My, <laughs> my, you. my, I'm, you uh, you know, I, I'm very familiar with just how serious they are in some ways. And, and um, I, I guess I'd like to put something on your radar. It's not really in the form of a question, but uh, I am concerned, and we're concerned on some of the security committees, that, uh, uh, that in intentional electromagnetic interference may someday be, or EMP may be our ultimate cybersecurity threat in terms of a national security uh, destructive to try to disrupt our systems and I, I would hope that we would have that on the radar. Uh, I realize that's a little ways down the road but uh, and perhaps not as far as it should be and I appreciate all of you for what you're doing. You're kind of the front line of, of freedom even though people don't see you and appreciate it. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Our time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. Thank you Mr. Chairman and I'd like to follow through on that same line of questioning but I'd like Ms. Durkin to uh, respond with the various levels of um, seriousness. Uh, first, uh, will the administration have a recommendation to address the concerns that uh, Professor Kerr pointed out that there's a split in the circuits on interpretation? Will you have a recommendation on how to deal with that split in the circuits? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Scott. As we have said in another forum, we, th we believe that there needs to be some clarification to the law in terms of what, particularly what exceeds authorized access is, but we think that what we need to make sure is that there are a number of insiders who have access to very valuable and confidential information, and we have to make sure that we still have the law enforcement tools necessary to protect against that threat. Well, do you have a legislative recommendation? We don't have a le specific legislative recommendation, but we're willing to work with your staff and provide technical assistance to reach those goals. Are there any other elements of the crime that um, need clarification? There's additional ones we need clarification. I think that we've, we've in our last year's proposal, we had how the, uh, the difference between felonies and misdemeanors and previous offenses. And so I think we can look at those issues. But I think that you're right um, and has been said before is the nature of the threat is evolving rapidly and it ranges everything from the consumers whose private data is threatened by hackers to the national security threats. We, the Department of Justice, has to deal with that full range of threats. And so the most important thing for us right now is not to create greater gaps in the law, but to ensure we have the tools that we need. In your statement, you um, mentioned that judges would still, of course, make sentencing decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, should we inf infer from that that the administration will not have any mandatory minimums in its recommendations? We, have, we are not uh, recommending mandatory minimums in this recommendations. The judicial discretion, as you know, is very important for the judge to be able to determine what level of penalty is important. I want to emphasize that the department does that at each stage of, the, of prosecutions as well, whether an investigation is merited in the first place, whether charges should be brought, and w then what plea or what sentence is appropriate. Well, we don't have to scour the recommendations for mandatory minimums. We'll assume they're not there. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, sir. Um, and a lot of these crimes, there's their overseas connections to some of these crimes. Does that create jurisdictional problems that we need to address legislatively? There may be some legislative fix we need to do that. The department has already taken some steps on the international front. 
Um, it is more and more important. More of these cyber cases, for example, in my district, we recently prosecuted a case where a small business in Seattle was hacked by someone who was in Maryland who traded the card information he got to a uh, Dutch citizen living in Romania who then sold them to someone in Los Angeles. We were able to bring the person in Maryland who has been con uh, prosecuted and convicted as well as extradite the person from Romania, charges penned against Los Angeles. So international cooperation is key and we're working on many fronts to make sure we have the most robust system possible. Are any legislative changes needed to help you in that regard? There may be some. There was one proposal that we had uh, that was approved in the previous budget that gave us additional resources abroad, what we call our I-CHIPS, international cyber prosecutors who can assist our foreign partners to make sure that we gather the evidence we need to bring the people and extradite them to America. Well, that brings me to the next question. A lot of this is resources and investigation. You've got the things in the statute. It's just a matter of priorities. This committee has looked at uh, things like ID theft where the consumer ID theft cases are not brought because you just don't have the resources. Organized retail theft where those cases aren't investigated because of resources. We're finding and uh, somebody fails a background check on a, on a gun purchase. Nothing is done because you don't have the resources. I guess, Mr. Bowles, uh, if you f focus more on cyber crime, w do you have enough resources to do the other things you need to do? And as part of that, what effect will the sequester have on your ability to continue doing your work? I keep going back to the next gen cyber, and that was one of our functions and one of our driving forces in, in, uh, in that. So the cyber division focuses entirely on in intrusions and pushing forward for the, for the high tech solution. But part of that was that uh, we've also added in, uh, impact and, and uh, emphasis on the, the traditional cyber. I'm sorry. You can continue your sentence. Okay, thank you. <laughs> on, on the traditional cyber crime, much like in the, uh, on the ID theft, sir. The time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers. Thank you very much. Uh, members of the panel, most of our serious computer hacking threats come from other countries. Uh, can any of you uh, discuss with me and, and make a point about how we can uh, better identify, uh, stop, and prosecute these attacks. Your uh, re recollection of what happened in a, another case is, uh, is very uh, compelling because we want to improve the law protecting against uh, cyber crime. And uh, the whole idea of this uh, hearing is to identify uh, where we should be going. I, I think I have about the only general law on uh, cyber privacy, uh, which I introduced uh, last year and will reintroduce today. And so I'd, I'd appreciate uh, and the. Uh, comments that have been made and, and uh, any that might be added uh, to this discussion. Who'd like to volunteer? I can address some of that, Congressman. First, uh, I want to be clear, while the international cyber threat is growing and complex, we have a lot of homegrown cyber actors as well. In my district, we regularly prosecute people who are located right in our district who are able to do a significant amount of damage to both individual consumers and to uh, businesses. With regards to your privacy legislation, obviously we've not had the opportunity to review it yet. We look forward to doing so when working with the staff of the committee. Uh, I will say that it has always been the position of the Department of Justice that all legislative proposals should carefully balance both the need to deter and hold accountable the bad actors with consumer privacy and civil rights, as well as making sure we have the adequate public-private partnerships. 
And so we will be, we look forward to working with you in that bill. Well, you've got the, the kind of a subcommittee here that's going to take this seriously. Uh, there have been so many things going on at, at, that it's, uh, especially in Judiciary Committee, that it's easy to, uh, for this to slip through the cracks. And I think this hearing is extremely important for focusing in on that. Mr. Conyers, let me say, I think the, it's, a, it's gonna take a complement of laws and a mix of the right criminal statutes. I think the um, corollary around data breach notification can be very important, particularly if it also encourages the kind of incentives for companies to build in security practices so that if there is a breach of consumer data, that that data will be essentially useless because it's been protected in the first instance. So I think as a federal government, we can do more to protect our systems. I think private sector can do more, and it's gonna take a mix of civil and criminal statutes to effectively deal with this. Professor Kerr? Yeah, just, just uh, one brief, brief comment. So the, the substantive law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, is already uh, jurisdictionally covers the world, covers, covers everything. In fact, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act covers every computer that the United States government can regulate around the world under the Constitution, under the Foreign Commerce Clause uh, and under the Interstate Commerce Clause. So uh, it will certainly apply to a foreign hacker who hacks into U.S. computers, to U.S. hacker that hacks into foreign computers, or even a foreign person that hacks into uh, other foreign computers through the U.S. So the, the substantive criminal law is very broad. The difficulty is always if somebody is outside the U.S., if the foreign government is going to cooperate with the U.S., then that's uh, a way that the U.S. can extradite, uh, have the person extradited and brought to the United States for prosecution. But if they're not a cooperative government, that's where the problem's going to be. Well, you know, I think that uh, we're going to have to put increased uh, emphasis on our uh, diplomacy aspect. I think the sooner uh, Chairman Sensenbrenner that we begin to look at that part of this problem, uh, the better off we're going to be in terms of, uh, of uh, getting as much cooperation as we can. Uh, we know that's going to vary from country to country, but it's still very important. Well, the time of the gentleman has expired, and I, I agree with the last point that the gentleman from Michigan has made since the uh, internet is completely internationalized and knows no boundaries, uh, 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 either for doing good or for breaking the law. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses uh, uh, for your uh, research, for your concerns, and for your testimony here today. It's my understanding that under uh, 18 U.S.C. 1030 that you know, it is a violation, a criminal violation of our law to um, do anything that helps take control of another computer even for a moment. Is that your understanding? Some general nods. Yeah, it, it depends uh, exactly what you mean by take control, but certainly if taking control includes gaining access to the computer mm -hmm. in order right. to take, assuming a network you're not supposed to take control of, uh, then yes, that would clearly be prohibited by the statute. Right. For example, my understanding is that there was uh, a recent example where someone had uh, inserted malware on their own computer such that when their computer was hacked and the data downloaded, it took the malware into the hacker, hacker's computer such that when uh, it was activated, it allowed the person whose computer was hacked to get a picture of the person looking at the screen. So they had the person that did the hacking and actually you know, did damage to all uh, the data that uh, was in the computer. Now, some of us would think that's terrific. That helps you get at the bad guys. But my understanding is that since that allowed the hack E to momentarily take over the computer and destroy information in that computer and to see who was using that computer, then actually that person would have been in violation in the United States would have been in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1030. 
So I'm wondering if perhaps one of the potential helps or solutions for us would be to amend 18 U.S.C. 1030 to make an exception such that uh, if the malware um, or the software that is uh, allows someone to take over a computer is taking over a hacker's computer, then it's not a violation. Perhaps it would be like we do for, um, uh, say, assaultive offenses, you have a self-defense. If this is part of a self-defense um, protection system, then it would not be, it would be a defense that you violated uh, 1030. Uh, anybody see any problems with helping people by amending our criminal code to allow such exceptions or have any suggestions along those lines? Uh, Mr. Gilmer, I think it's a great uh, it's a great question and one that's uh, very much debated in computer security circles because from what I hear there is a lot of this sort of hacking back as they refer to it uh, but at least under current law it is mostly illegal to, to do that. Uh, there is a limited necessity defense that some courts have recognized to say basically if you're a victim of a crime you have a certain amount of ability to act to try to stop that crime but it's not really clear how the necessity defense as it's recognized in current federal law would apply in those circumstances. I, I, I think the idea of saying there's some ability to uh, counter hack, hack back, however you want to describe it, uh, is, is a sound one. The, the real difficulties in the, in the details of how do you do it? In what circumstances do you allow somebody to uh, counter hack? How broadly are they allowed to counter hack? How far can they go? Uh, the difficulty, I think, is once you open that door as a matter of law, uh, it, it can be something that's difficult to cabin. So I think if there is such an exception, it should be a quite narrow one to avoid it from sort of becoming the exception that swallows the rule. Well, I, I'm not sure that I would care if it destroyed a hacker's computer completely uh, as long as it was confined to that hacker. Are, are you saying we need to afford the hacker protection so that we don't hurt him too bad? No, no, the difficulty is that you don't know who the hacker is. So it might be that you think the hacker is one person, but actually they're routing communication. Let's say you think you're being hacked from a French company or even a company in the United States. Oh, and it might be the United States government, and we don't want to hurt them if they're snooping on our people. Is that, I don't. No, the, the I don't really understand why you're wanting to be protective of the hacker. The, the difficulty is first identifying who is the hacker. You don't know when somebody's in, intruding into your network who's behind it. So all you'll know is that there's an IP address that seems to go back to a specific computer. But, but you won't know who it is that's behind the attack. That's the difficulty. Uh, the time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman. I guess my uh, first question, maybe first two questions, will go to Mr. Holliman. And you, you talked about information sharing, you talked about uh, security, and, and you talked about uh, oversight over critical networks. And we had that bill last year in uh, Homeland Security, which was the PRECISE Act, which when it came up, the interesting thing about it, it was a pretty decent bill at the time that shared bipartisan support. But when it came up for markup, it was gutted by uh, the author, with, which was a strange thing. But that's because we couldn't get, uh, or he couldn't get leadership to, to move on the issue and bring it up to a fl floor vote if it was that comprehensive. So uh, I guess I'm asking you your thoughts on the PRECISE Act and was that going in the right direction? Congressman, thanks, thank you for that question. You know, I know in the last Congress there were a number of pieces of legislation that were considered, several of which were approved. Um, we believe it's important for Congress to supplement what the President did in his executive order with not only the op oversight but with additional legislation. I think the executive order has tried to do, you know, I'd need to look back at the elements of the PRECISE Act uh, to be able to comment further, but I think the, it, the President's executive order has tried to address many of the elements that would have been outlined in the PRECISE Act. So whether or not that act would be needed at this point in time, I can't comment on I'd be happy to look at that for the record. Uh, if anyone else wanted to comment on it, that's fine. 
my, my next question would be, you mentioned uh, one of the elements and one of the things we should be doing is continuing or uh, creating a robust uh, R&D for cybersecurity. And I guess my question would be, would that be in the term of maybe an R&D tax credit, or are you thinking of something like uh, NIH and grants to uh, people who want to do that type of research for cybersecurity? Well, I think there are really three elements of it. Um, one is that we don't have enough students who are being trained as professionals to be able to work in cybersecurity for the future, and that's a problem for the private sector and for the government. Uh, so we need to have the right education and the right training. Secondly, I think we need the right cooperative agree agreements between private sector and government to allow that research to happen, including with university research. And certainly, finally, there is research that goes on at the federal government about the level and the nature and evolving threats. And that research needs to be uh, properly funded and there needs to be proper oversight. So I think it takes all three of those. And I guess I have a third question for you. And I think that, uh, and on oh, Mr. Kerr, uh, I think that um, Ms. Durkin and Mr. Demarest will probably uh, know the answer too. But part of it's from your organization standpoint and, and from your experience, the level of of cooperation and information sharing and assistance that our uh, security agencies provide now. And, and sometimes we get the benefit of, of hearings that uh, are not public, but I'm interested in, in knowing from your perspective the interaction between the FBI, CIA, Department of Justice, and those in terms of helping uh, either avert or uh, on the back end find uh, the perpetrators. So how's that been for, with you all? Well, I'll start by saying I think the, the nature of that is, is critical and we're certainly very good relationships. What we need is to be able to share more real-time threat information, not simply after the fact, but real-time threat information that's part of what the President's tried to do in his executive order and part of what we think Congress can supplement that would make it even um, easier and better for industry to share information with the government too. And, and I understand that the barriers for the industry, what's the biggest barrier, or if you want to do a comprehensive, what are the biggest barriers to doing it? Is it just permission and law uh, for real-time information sharing? Yeah, I, I think some of it is sort of the existing laws that, that, that private sector companies feel like they, ha they must and appropriately adhere to, which in some cases makes it difficult, if not impossible, to share real-time threat information. So you can only do something about it after the fact. Um, that's not in anyone's interest to do that, so we need the appropriate way to be able to share that uh, with the federal government. Mr. Chairman, in the sake of time, I'll yield back. The time of the gentleman had expired. <laughs> A gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to um, ask about uh, economic espionage and, and uh, the stealing of, of intellectual property, um, of trade secrets, customer lists, future plans, and contracts. And um, uh, Mr. Holliman, I wanted to, uh, to ask you, you, you said that, uh, that Symantec uh, estimated that it lost uh, $110 billion um, through e economic espionage uh, and the stealing of IP uh, through these means. Um, what, what do you think is the overall cost uh, to, to the, the corporations that you represent? Well, that, the Symantec number came from their internet security threat report, and it really related to the total amount of losses. It wasn't sort of referring to, to their company losses. And so the figure of $110 billion of damages on consumers is what they cited. Um, I think that all of the data shows, and certainly the information that's being very public and that the chairman spoke of in his opening remarks, shows that the nature of the threat is increasing, and it's increasing substantially. Uh, McAfee, one of our members, estimated that it used to be that a new piece of malware was identified and put into action about every 15 minutes, and now they estimate it's one per second. So the pace at which this is occurring is huge. The consequence and losses are growing. 
Um, and this is exactly the kind of hearing this committee and other committees should be focused on because we're all in this together. And, and what is the private sector doing to minimize these intrusions and to protect intellectual property throughout all these layers? Well, I think the Attorney General, um, the IP Enforcement Coordinator, the Homeland Security Secretary, um, about three weeks ago had a major discussion about uh, theft of trade secrets, and I know members of this committee were part of that process. Um, one, I think it's sort of building awareness. Two, it's building best practices. Three is security companies. We're working to create uh, faster, more effective ways of preventing these intrusions to share information about the threats when they occur. Uh, and, you know, it, and it's a race. I mean, it is a race, and we're in the business of trying to help prepare us, but a lot of it's going to take education on the part of businesses and consumers and the federal government, uh, who is the biggest source of attacks against the federal government. The federal government has to be using the strongest security to try to limit those attacks. So, I mean, we're, we are all in this together. Our companies uh, want to do more things, that, particularly ensure small and medium enterprises and others build in security procedures so that if there are breaches of their information, and there will be from time to time, that that information is rendered useless so that the hacker or the perpetrator can't do anything with it because it's been secured through encryption or other means. And those additional incentives will be helpful to a long-term solution. Um, I wanted to make sure law enforcement has the tools that it needs to, to prosecute these cases and investigate them. And uh, uh, Ms. Durkin and Mr. Bowles, I wanted to know, to know um, Ms. Durkin, uh, I note that the DOG, DOJ leads vigorous prosecutions in cyber theft and economic espionage. I'm curious to know how frequently a case uh, regarding intellectual property appears in your case load, and if you feel like you have the appropriate tools like training and funding to effectively prosecute these cases. Thank you. Um, it is a sig very significant part of our district's work. We have some small mom and pop corporations like Boeing, Amazon, Microsoft and the like where the, the proprietary information, as the chairman said, is their most valuable commodity. So we c consistently work with those corporations to make sure that we're getting the appropriate referrals. We have specially trained prosecutors. We will say we've, we will always take more resources because the threat is evolving, but we appreciate the resources this committee has given to us. And Mr. Bowles, uh, do you have the adequate training and funding to carry on your investigations? Like my partner, Ms. Durgan, said, we'll always take more. Uh, it's, it's important. It is a high-tech and evolving thing. Uh, and, and just to give you a feel for it, we, ha we currently have about 1,100 cases ongoing in the FBI that involve uh, intellectual property theft. And it cuts across all of our, our programs, whether it be cyber, counter in counterintelligence, and in uh, traditional criminal. So it, it's, it's a wide-ranging need that we have, and it's part of our, our drive is to make sure that all the, uh, all the investigators and the analysts and the support folks have the training that they need uh, the, as we push that out and go forward in the computer world, but uh, you know, that's a that's a need that we constantly reassess and try to address. Gentlewoman's time has expired. The chair will recognize himself for a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Ms. Durkin, uh, in response to Mr. Scott's question, you said in the administration's proposal there are no mandatory minimum sentences. My understanding is the bill the administration sent us up in the last Congress had mandatory minimums. What made them change their mind? We assess a variety of factors, and at this time, the, we are not supporting that, but we'll be happy to work with your staff to answer any further questions that the chairman well, may have. Well, what factors there. were those? We will look at the number of factors we have to, as what our priorities are in addressing the statute. And right now, we see that as, this, as the threat is evolving, what we really need are tools that can address some of the gaps we see in the law to make sure that we disrupt, deter crimes in the first instance and hold people accountable. Well, but there, you know, uh, there are two separate things. You know, when we're talking about mandatory minimums, we're talking about after a conviction when the judge pronounces a sentence. Uh, there certainly is not uh, a lot of effort and a lot of money that is required to go into that. Uh, particularly with a mandatory minimum giving the judge little or no discretion. Um, I, I think you're trying to confuse apples with oranges and not get into uh, the fact that uh, does the administration oppose mandatory minimums as a matter of principle or don't they think that the crimes that we're talking about here deserve a mandatory minimum? 
No, I think what you're getting at, Chairman, is what's the appropriate sanction for these activities, and we agree that we must assess and make sure that these bad actors are held accountable under the law. It's one reason why we support increasing the, the statutory maximum in the fraud scenario to bring that on par, because there are some cases where that is the only statute available, but yet a judge would not be able to assess the nature of the crime that occurred and assess the appropriate penalty. And so as the Department of Justice is always going to look at the factors present in a case and make sure that we are recommending to a judge what the appropriate sanction is. And then, of course, the judge needs to have the discretion and the ability to make sure that that sanction can be imposed so that we both deter the crime in the first instance and hold the people accountable when it occurs. Yeah. Uh, I think we are going to be talking about this issue a lot more as legislation is developed. Uh, 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 I disagree with that conclusion, and uh, I do want to spend some time asking two questions of Professor Kerr. Um, you know, I'm a little bit concerned, Professor Kerr, about uh, uh, your idea that there should be certain things that are currently criminal that should not be criminal anymore. And let me pose a hypothetical to you. Uh, say that there is a foreign agent that's employed by a U.S. tech company. And he was ordered to check to see that the company was not working on a certain project using process of elimination to see who is working on that project. The spy exceeds the authorized access and determines that the company really isn't working on the project. Now, in this example, nothing was taken or damaged, but shouldn't the Justice Department have a tool uh, to be able to do something about that even though another crime was not committed? In that situation, I imagine there would be another crime committed. I'm thinking in terms of attempt liability for attempted, uh, I, I gather the goal was to ultimately determine confidential information relating to the company as to what the company was or was not doing. Uh, and so it would be an attempted, either attempted theft of that information or um, I'm, I'm not sure of the criminal statutes governing spying, for example, but I would, uh, I think that the key idea is that it's not a computer-related offense. It just, it just so happens that that offense involves computer-related conduct. Mm -hmm. But it should be treated under the law just as it would be if the uh, spy were going into a locked closet instead of a locked computer. It doesn't make any difference as to whether it's a physical or a computer crime. So, so um, uh, my, my approach would be just to uh, resolve the circuit split uh, by adopting the Ninth Circuit standard, which is treating hacking like hacking and uh, treating physical world offenses like uh, uh, computer crime offenses like the physical world analogy. Okay, well, let, let me uh, go into the trespass uh, issue that, that you talked about. Now, it's obvious if somebody got into uh, the mechanical room at Space Mountain in Disney World and, you know, pulled the pin on that and all of a sudden the, uh, uh, the car is, you know, stopped abruptly and if nobody was injured, maybe it was lucky. But, you know, how about a cyber trespass that would have just as much damage and that would be a violation of a term uh, of service and shouldn't that be criminalized as well? Uh, it should be criminalized, but not because of the terms of service violation. It could be criminalized under a number of different theories. First, it would be access without authorization, because I'm assuming that breaking into the sort of the computer that is controlling this machine uh, would itself be password protected. It's not like anyone can walk up and pull, pull something on the machine. Uh, also, that it would be a, a Section 1030A5 violation, which is intentionally causing damage to a protected computer without authorization, and that is a separate criminal statute that does not involve unauthorized access. It's sort of intentionally causing damage without authorization. So these are all situations that would already be criminalized without the need to, re to, to, to go to the unauthorized access prohibition. Okay, well, my time is up. So I'd like to thank all of the witnesses for appearing today, uh, for being brief in the answers to your questions so that we Republicans can go listen to what the President has to say. And I understand you Democrats will have that pleasure sometime in the future very soon. So without objection, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>